right, excellent afternoon to all our viewers across the globe. And I must say that you should choose your leaders carefully. Yes, choose your leaders wisely. It is only when you choose your leaders right or your choices are right that you that your affairs are gu guarded and I must say your interests are pr protected again. Excellent afternoon. And of course, you are on to another interesting edition of Real Talk with Kikari. May your convener, Kikelo Matanda. And of course, uh, one of the Real Talkers is absent today. But not to worry, I have the... Atarodo on the platform today. Her name is Damilola. How are you doing, my darling? I like the fact that we're really edge to edge. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, viewer, from everywhere. You have the privilege and the opportunity to see us today. It's another beautiful Tuesday. My name is Damilola Banure. I hope we're keeping it real and we continue to pray for our dear country, Nigeria, because there is no place like home. My people will say, when you travel far and wide, you're still going to have to come back home. Mm. So it is important that we keep praying for Nigeria and God will bless Nigeria. Please stay tuned. Today is going to be another sourceful and beautiful day with a resourceful guest. And of course, my main host, the chief host, is here and uh -huh. looking sly in orange. I thought I said this color can blind somebody. <laughs> Only to wear go to look at you. Yeah, that's is she serious. Oh, yes, she is. Thank uh, you for joining us. All right, guys. So let me take this time out to celebrate again with one of the I uh, would like to say sponsors, or would like to say leaders of my country, or about our country. Uh, yesterday was his birthday. That is a lend, barrister Alain Oyema. You know, that's CEO the CEO of Airpeace. And, you know, we celebrated him loudly in his office. And I must say congratulations again and happy birthday. He's one of those who I would say that has, you know, provided leverage for ZEDGE, my office, uh, my consulting um, firm. And, of course, when it comes to Real Talk with Kike, both on TV and on radio, and apart from being what the sponsor of this platform is also a, a noble man yes and a national icon um, whose interest in, the, in, in this well-being of Nigeria has been reckoned with and of course is the strongest supporters of our dreams and a believer in people's um, greatness so on behalf of Real Talk with Kikia, we, we say, say happy, happy birthday, birthday sir, again, Arias. Yeah. We hope to see you when you're 18, 19, in good health and sound mind. Mm. All right, then. So um, I think um, let's hear what our uh, African leader called Idimu Aminu of uh, Uganda, Uganda, you know, <laughs> had to say of what history is reminding us of on this day in history segment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. On this day in history, March 29, 1979, Indi Amin Dada fled towards his tribal homeland of Kakwa as his rule of Uganda crumbles. In 1971, General Indi Amin overthrew the elected government of Milton Obote and declared himself president of Uganda, launching a ruthless eight-year regime in which an estimated 300,000 civilians were massacred. His expulsion of all Indian and Pakistan citizens in 1972, along with increasing military expenditures, brought about the country's economic decline, the impact of which lasted decades. In 1979, his reign of terror came to an end as Ugandan exiles and Tanzanians took control of the capital of Kamala, forcing Amin to flee. Never brought to justice for his heinous crimes, Amin lived out the remainder of his life in Saudi Arabia. Did you know that during his time in the army, Amin became the light heavyweight boxing champion of Uganda, a title he held for nine years between 1951 and 1960? Well, yes. Right, many thanks for staying with us, you know, exactly um, how many years ago, in 1979, this happened, and uh, how he flew to his homeland. Damnola, let me come to you quickly. What's your take on uh, this day in history segment? I, I think that I've been, I've been, I've heard the dear me for the first time from my mom when I was a lot younger, and um, the popular connotation of the dear me then was because he was into rituals and cannibalism, and of course, he was referred to as the butcher of Uganda. And um, of course, history also has it that he had then a killer squad under the titles of um, research, um, state research bureau, and they were um, they were actually responsible for tens and thousands of abduction, murder, and. This didn't happen just because it happened. It happened because I also read history said that his mother is an herbalist. Mm. So maybe this was so much reason why um, he was power drunk or he, people felt that or accused him of using um, other people for rituals and involved in, involving his involvement in cannibalism. 
But however, the Idiami story, I also know that he was referred to as the field marshal, which is the highest authority in the military um, organogram. And of course, nobody could ask Idiami. And at the point of his rule, well, there is no king that reigns forever. Like oh, our yes. people will say, there's no forever champion. It's current champion. But during the time he ruled, and that's what I always think that we translate to people around that. Idi Amin, history didn't forget him. I was not more than seven or eight years when I started hearing the name Idi Amin. And now I'm over 30s. I'm way in my late 30s. And history can tell us what and who Idi Amin was. And even to now, his death was, he was buried in South Africa, um, Saudi Arabia, according to sources that he couldn't come into Uganda, even when the Ugandans accepted that he could be buried in Uganda with so much atrocities that All he has right. committed. So a lot, a lot, a lot. But I would like you to also make a research about Idi Amin so that we will live for posterity. All right, I think you've said it. I opened the show uh, with um, um, me making a wise choice of, um, we making a wise choice of leaders. That is because of the presidential candidates have, that have started emerging from various uh, political parties. And we don't have to start uh, meeting them in their posters or starting having contact with them when they start reading their manifesto. So um, I feel that um, party primaries are scheduled to kick off, or I know that party primaries are scheduled to kick off, um, I think, uh, around, uh, according to INEC timetable, from April, April to May 2023. And I must say that Real Talk Ukike is making this easier on our mandate. I will be bringing on our presidential aspirants one after the other on this show. And for today, we'll be interviewing Professor, the main professor himself, and the political economist. And with so many ideas, um, I feel that he, he has when it comes to building um, and innovating the new Nigeria, like I've heard him speak on many platforms. All right, welcome to the show, Professor Mogali. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. But before we dive into the topic at hand, I think that uh, I must say that aside welcoming you, knowing that uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show because I align with my Igbo background today. You know, <laughs> I commend your great passion for this great country okay. and beyond ethnic sentiments. And I must say that um, personally, I've heard you speak on different platforms. And I say, well done at all that you are doing. I wanted to serve this great nation. But how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. The struggle continues. Yes, oh, yeah, the yes, struggle yes. continues. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So um, before we move into the future with um, elections, let me take a brief look into um, our past. When I say our past, I mean the past and the present. What's your assessment of the eight years of Buhari's presidency? And why do you think um, you are the best man for the job? And aside that, maybe another follow-up question to ask after answering that is, what are you bringing to the table for Nigerians? And do you think the idea of an Igbo presidency, uh, uh, the time has come for the Igbo, Igbo people? Well, thank you. Thank you, Fuki. Um, thank you for inviting me to your show. Uh, obviously, the eight years of uh, the past uh, presidency, which is still ongoing, um, have been very difficult. Um, many of us have been disappointed. Uh, many people had high hopes, things could have been better. But today, you know, we have problems that are very fundamental, far more than we have had in the past. But I want to say that those problems did not begin today. Um, they did not even begin under this administration. Nigeria has generally had uh, many years of failed leadership under the current democratic dispensation. Now we have security problems. Insecurity is rising. Ungoverned spaces in Nigeria are expanding and governed spaces are shrinking. Uh, you know what is going on in Kaduna, the attack on the airport, uh, the, bo uh, the reported bombing of the train, the train line. All these things tell you that if we are not very careful, uh, terrorism could, and terrorists will take over this country in a few uh, and, and we could be going the way of Afghanistan. So this is a big worry. And then we see that economically, we're in very dire straits. Uh, inflation is extremely high. Many people can no longer afford the price of a loaf of bread or a tuba of yam or a, you know, a mudu of rice or gari. So, you know, life is just getting very difficult. Diesel is at 700. Petrol scarcity everywhere. So these are not the best of times, clearly. Now, the question is, you, you, what do we do? We cannot 
continue to write the book of lamentations. Nigerians, because we're in a democracy, it is up to all of us as citizens to change the situation in which we find ourselves. There is only one way we can change it, and that is at the ballot box. And that is to bring in the kind of leadership that today and tomorrow calls for. Not the leadership we've had in the past. The past is gone. We need to face the future. We need to move into the 21st century with confidence and assurance. And we need to make that 21st century one that works for all Nigerians, especially our young people who make up almost 70% of our population. So I believe that I have what Nigeria requires today, that I have the solution to Nigeria's problems, solutions of leadership, solutions of knowledge, experience, and a track record in the function of the president. Many people think the presidency is just a political promotion. You've been a governor, you've been a senator, so you can be promoted to being president. But the presidency is a job, just like any other job. And if you interview for your program or for your studio, and you select somebody who is in the fit for the role, you will get bad outcomes. It doesn't matter how many elections the person has won. It doesn't matter how many years he or she has been a so-called big politician. The job of the president calls for somebody who is competent and knowledgeable and visionary, especially in four areas. And that is nation building, national security, the economy, and foreign affairs. There is no one in the field today aspiring to be president who has that background and track record as much as I do. So this is why I believe. And of course, I also would represent a generational change for many Nigerians. Many young people and older people support my candidacy uh, and, and the vision I have for this country. I have a vision for Nigeria and the capacity to make it happen, to execute it. We are God's children too. The citizens of Dubai and Japan and Singapore and Malaysia and America and Europe, they don't have two heads. What they have is two things. They've had leaders who are competent. Two, those citizens themselves as followers have done their duty to make sure that they elect competent leaders. We complain a lot about our leaders, but as citizens, we continue to go back to the polls and vote for the people we are complaining about because, quote unquote, they are in the big parties. They are in APC, the MPDP. If they have not delivered, and in 23 years, actually, they haven't delivered. All we have is less than 4,000 megawatts of electricity today and one of the highest rates of unemployment in the world. Why would you go back and be voting for political parties like this, except they make a radical change in who their candidates are, and we have not seen that. So what I bring to the table is a vision to unify Nigeria, to turn Nigeria from country to nation, setting out an ambition, a national ambition that all of us as Nigerians can key into, an ambition that rises above the things that divide us, that does for us what football does for us. Today, Nigeria and Ghana are playing and they have closed down the civil service. So if you can do, if football can, can make us do this, can make us find our nationhood in those fleeting 90 minutes, what I want to do is to create four years of that 90 minutes in which we are one country and one nation with an ambition, a common destiny. So this is what I bring. I bring a competence to run the economy of this country, to create jobs for young people. I bring the competence in foreign affairs. I bring the competence in national security because security is not about being a military general or being a soldier. Security is about understanding what drives security and insecurity in the 21st century. And that includes or starts with human security. If somebody has an empty stomach, has not gone to school, has no skills, that person is an angry person, no job. They will be prey for terrorists. That's one of the reasons we are where we are today. Professor, we need to go and solve problems at the roots. Professor, it's nice to hear you speak um, on a very direct platform here. 
and I must say that um, looking at your, even from your appointment from the WHO to the United Nations, CBN, yes, I agree that you have such a very robust uh, profile that Nigerians need to really look into. Now, I'd want to borrow from your statement saying that we need to make a radical change. It yes. begs my curiosity to say, who is making this change? Because if you and I will critically look at the Nigerian youth, who make up about 70% of our population in general, I really do not yeah. think that the youths are ready to take the bulls by the horn, considering a lot of factors like hunger, unemployment, and it seems like we are not even looking at the bigger picture. We are looking at the next four years. But the next four years yeah. is another yardstick to another 16 years of probably suffering or goodness, depending on the route we choose to toll. So do you think that the Nigerian youths are even ready to make this radical change? I believe we can make them ready. I believe we can help them to become ready with continual political education, um, with engagement, you know, and, and campaigns when the time comes directed at them and their issues. I, for example, have a seven point agenda for Nigeria's young people. And they include things like providing temporary unemployment support when they graduate from universities or tertiary institutions for six months to one year provided that you learn skills during that period, uh, provided that you, you prepare yourself to create your own job in case you... Are we still here? Can we get that? Hello, are you there? Hello? All right. Okay. Can, can you hear us? I, I doubt if you can. All right. Um, I, I, I want to be sure that we can hear him. No? All right, can okay. you hear us, sir? Yes. All right, okay, we lost you for a few seconds. All right, all right. I, I'm, I, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Sometimes that might happen. The network but, uh, might be very erratic. It's yeah. one of our problems yes. in the country. All right. Absolutely. We, right. Need, we, need, we need proper, you know, telecommunication bandwidth in this country. All right. So, um, so I was saying that I would create, as president, a one trillion naira venture capital fund. 500 billion of it will be an investment by my government. Another 500 billion will come from the private sector. The private sector will manage the fund. And this fund will invest in new businesses to be started by young people. It will finance the commercialization of products of innovation. And it will train young people with the skills they need for the 21st century. Jobs are very different now from the way they used to be. Most economies that are prosperous, young people create their own jobs. And that's what we have to be doing in Nigeria. And of course, we have to manage our population. So I would work on police reform. And very importantly, the educational sector must be reformed. When I become president of this country, ASU strikes will end forever in this country. Because I'll get to the root of the matter. I'm a professor. I understand the issues, you know. And our young children should not have to go through what our educational system is going through. It has collapsed entirely. How do you build the future? How do you train young people with the skills to employ themselves or to find employment? The educational system is constantly come at those price. So these are the issues that, that, that you know, um, when we talk about young people and the youth, yes, many of them have been confused by the collapse of values in Nigeria, you know, the materialism, the worship of the big politicians, you know, uh, being happy slaves. We cannot allow this to continue. Our citizens can no longer be happy slaves. We have to open their eyes for 2023. We have to shine our eye, as they say. So I know there are challenges there, but we will all work together with love, uh, with empathy, with hope and faith with our young people the problems in Nigeria today are so bad that many Nigerians, including young people, are increasingly expressing their tiredness with the old order um, of, of politics in Nigeria. And they're looking for something new and different, and I hope to be the person to provide it. And my party, the ADC, the African Democratic Congress, as well. All right, many thanks, Professor 
Mogalu for all that you've shared thus far. I think from the first question that I asked you, you've actually answered most of my questions in, 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 when it comes to fixing um, Nigerian economy and some of the challenges we are facing in terms of um, unemployment rates um, close to 50%. And of course, the foreign reserve that is uh, quite down at the moment. But moving on into tackling the insecurity in our country, you know, insecurity, insurgency, and terrorism is a major problem on the hands of this administration. Administration. So just yesterday, just like you emphasized in one of your submission when I was asking you earlier, you mentioned how the Abuja Kaduna train was attacked by the bandits and terrorists. So I, I would like to know, because I feel that we keep losing lives and stability um, is, it seems to be a challenge in our country today. How do you plan to tackle this, if I may ask? Well, you know, every, many countries are faced with challenges of terrorism. The difference between the United States and other countries and Nigeria is that other countries equip themselves to, to fight terrorism and defeat it. We are not equipped to fight terrorism and defeat it because terrorists are not a regular army. They are, they are people who work in very different ways. So we have to respond to them in very different ways. For example, Many people, many terrorists occupy these forests, Sambisa, wherever the forests are. And we're busy ordering Tucano jets to bomb them. But we have an army of 250,000 people. That is too small. You have to have an army that is large enough and equipped enough to take the ground in the forest and control it. Before your jets come and bomb, the military must sec. If the jets bomb, but there's no foot soldiers going into the forest, to fight the, the terrorists where they are based and to secure it, then you will not defeat them. Also, you have to look at issues of corruption. We have heard many, many reports about corruption in the security and military uh, networks that some people have now seen the fight against Boko Haram and terrorists as a business. So they really don't want terrorism to end. This is terrible. Why does this happen? Because there isn't a sense of nationhood, there isn't a sense of patriotism, and there needs to be far more political will on the part of the president. For me, if I were president of Nigeria, one Nigerian life taken is too many. I will, I will respond to it. Look at the Americans. Kill one of their citizens. They will hunt you down and waste you so that you learn the lesson that the rights of citizens matters to the government. We don't see that in Nigeria. So we need to change our security network with, and improve it with intelligence. We need to improve intelligence gathering. Intelligence is the backbone of security of any, in any country and fighting terrorism successfully. Many thanks for staying with us. Glad to know you're still with us. In case you just joined the show, today's interview is with Professor Kingsley Magolo, the first presidential candidate of the ADC. And of course, he has been on the show, on the show sharing with us his vision, the mission for a new Nigeria. And um, let me quickly open our phone lines. Remember that you can be part of this conversation by calling the studio number 08088. 77400 again 080 showing on your screen right now and of course we are streaming live on on our youtube page and of, of course on facebook page both on real talk we can on silverbird platform and i must say professor mogali many thanks for all you've shared thus far but let me just tilt a little bit into um um your book you know you wrote a, you, you you touched on um, building um, you know, yeah, build, innovate, and grow, uh, which is uh, yeah, really. what, what you wrote last in your book. But I must ask you, how can that innovation move Nigeria forward and foster growth and development in our country today? Well, you, you, you know, the way it will look is this. We have a lot of young people who are very bright and inventive. They innovate new things and new ways of doing things. So my government as president will create an ecosystem that supports them. Um, to a lot of times in Nigeria, you see people with products of innovation on newspapers. After that, nothing happens. That's why I talked about this one trillion Naira Venture Capital Fund, because it will invest in these products of innovation and it can then be, they can be manufactured and refined and mass produced, you know, and this creates jobs creates jobs for the inventor and wealth for the inventor, creates wealth for the middleman, 
creates wealth for the retailer. So our markets, if you enter the market, you will see the products of inventive people in this country. And we have many, many, many of them. But right now, they are not being encouraged sufficiently. There's no ecosystem that supports them. And we have not made this a priority. If you look at the Western world, 400 years ago, most of the world was poor. The only people who were rich were the kings and the queens and the princes and the landed gentry. What created, the, what democratized wealth in the world was innovation. When people began to invent things, the steam engine, you know, the Morse code and the telephone, you know, and the electric light bulb, the refrigerator, and one of my favorites, the toilet seat, which I think the flushing toilet, I think is one of the most brilliant things that have ever happened in world history. Because the, the impact on public health has been huge and sanitation. So this improves the quality of lives. And as people's lives uh, are being improved and they are inventing these things, people are improving the quality of their lives and creating wealth at the same time. So this is innovation is the secret of the wealth of nations. And that is the big thing I'm going to bring as president. Nigeria will become a startup nation in this country just like we see in places like Israel, you know, and, and uh, uh, Singapore and many other countries. They focus on innovation. They focus on the educational system so that the education is tilted towards science and technology a lot. And this creates opportunities to manufacture, to invent, and, and to create wealth. So this is my approach uh, to the matter of innovation. When I wrote that book, Build, Innovate, and Grow, my vision for our country. I set it out. Here's my vision for Nigeria. Now, within the next 20 years, we should be like Malaysia. We should be like Dubai. We should be like Singapore. Of course, nobody stays in office for 20 years under our current constitution. So it has to be a cycle of four years, four years, then maybe another eight years by equally competent and visionary leaders. So we must focus on the leadership selection and not look at who is your president as just a political exercise. It is far more than that. There is a direct impact between the quality of our lives, whether we have electricity, whether we have water, whether our schools can stay open for one year without going on strike. There's a direct relationship between these things and who you go and put your thumb for in the ballot. Think carefully, observe clearly, and act decisively for a change in Nigeria's trajectory. We must move away in 2023 from the old order. Otherwise, you know, the, the problems will just continue and get worse. So much. Um, I think I'd like to delve into the part that um, it's one person who is called the president and who is being voted for. But there are numerous people that surround the president, from the ministers to the SSAs and so many other um, people. I would like to know your choice of cabinet members. I'm looking at yes. you as, of course, a very cerebral person, being a professor, you know your onions. I've heard you speak to a couple of times. And what are we looking at into your um, cabinet selection? Are we selecting based on ethnicity? Are we selecting based on competence? Are we selecting based on what we bring to the table? Empathy, the people who can deliver. Because it's well enough yeah. to have you as the president, but how about the subordinates who are going to work with you to make your administration a, a beautiful one? Let me use that word. Absolutely. You've just struck on the nerve. And this is one of the big things about me. You know, I care about Nigerians and I want to see the progress of all of us. I have said before that when I become president, I'm coming in with a dream team, a dream team of very competent people that, are, that come from the, the, the north of this country, the south, the west, the east, you know. So there's going to be an inclusive team. And many people are going to come in based solely on their track record and their competence. I want to tell you that even as I am now, I know at least one quarter to one third of who will be in my cabinet as president. They don't know. And some of them don't know me personally. Uh, but I have seen them. I have observed them. And I know that these are people that if you give them an opportunity, they can make life better for Nigerians. And when the time comes, they will receive a phone call that will surprise them. And they will be brought in. Uh, to every leader is only as good as his team. No one person can transform Nigeria. What the leader does and what I will do is to provide the vision, mobilize the team, inspire them, motivate them, 
and give them the guide, the, the, the uh, matching orders, and then monitor performance because you must monitor performance. Um, and so, when I become president, there will be four critical units in the office of the president in Asorok that will be new. And that is one, the Office of National Strategy. Two, the National Office of Risk Management. Three, the Office of Performance Management. And four, the Office of Talent Management. We will bring 21st century modern governance that can bring transformation. And this is how you do it. You've got to have a strategy, and that strategy has to be managed. It has to be executed. It has to be evaluated. You've got to manage the risks that prevent precedents from fulfilling professor, their promises. Professor, yes. amongst your cabinet members, are we also looking at youth? Because I'm um, looking at you and considering your age, you're a balance between the younger generation and the older generation. So are we looking at people yes. around your age group? I know that it's easier to probably juggle ideas around one's age group or people around like of like minds. So are we looking at such people on this team? You are looking at a mix. You're looking at a cabinet that will aspire to be 50-50 male and female and 50-50 youth and older. So it's going to be a balanced cabinet. Um, there's, a, there's room for everybody. You know, there's room for young people, but the young people will form the backbone of my administration. I've got to tell you that because I see myself as a bridge between the past and the future. And the whole point is to train and equip them and hand over the future to them and let them run with it. So there'll be a lot of young people in my cabinet. There'll be a lot of women in my cabinet, but they will not be selected just because they are women, or just because they are youth. They will be selected because they are competent and have shown a track record in their areas of expertise. All right. That is what we're All right, many thanks for that, sir. We are running out of time and I think we still have quite a number of things to ask you. And I think that I would like to describe um, Africa as, um, um, how will I put it now, you, you last described Africa as the last frontier when recent development yes. in the world uh, came up. And currently, Africa is affected by um, COVID-19, you know, and the supply chain disruptions in the world. And I must ask you, how do you think Africa can cope through uh, all of this? And especially talking about Nigeria, knowing that we are the giants in this Africa, and our challenges are kind of peculiar to us in one way or the other that I think that doesn't align with the rest of the world. What's your take on this quickly? Well, very quickly, I think it comes back to the matter of innovation, science, and technology. We have the talent, we have the skills, we have the ability, and we must develop it to industrial scale to, to, to create the, the uh, manufacture, the products, pharmaceuticals, um, products of public health that can help us fight public health pandemics like COVID so that our supply chains do not depend too much on external sources. Follow this. I, so might this have to, I might have to interrupt your line of thoughts. We have a caller on the line. Many thanks for calling. And where are you calling from, please? Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you reduce yeah. the volume of your TV set, please? Yeah, I think I've seen it. All right. Carol yeah. from Edo States. Many thanks for calling. What's your contribution on the topic at hand? I just want to mention the point. Uh, I have taken my time to observe him and listen to him so very much. Well done, sir. I can see from your uh, discussion so far that you know too much. I think this is the kind of personality Nigeria has been preparing for. Now, the people who control the holding those knowledge, but the people who have the current knowledge of leadership. I think uh, Nigeria should be to take a direction. And uh, what about this uh, some look at uh, individuals? For your contribution yeah. at hand. So, sir, like you were saying earlier, you know, talking about um, some of the challenges that we are facing globally, I think let me quickly add to that because I know that uh, they've been running commentary in my years that we need to wrap up. You know, I know that the amended Electoral Heart 2022, particularly Section um, 84 to 12, allowing public office holders to remain in office while declaring for po uh, political uh, positions. What do you think, for instance, um, the CBN governor is currently in office and we are seeing um, the Arewa youth campaigning for him and yet is yet to declare his intentions, saying that um, um, he's, still, he's still in office and he, that is all about it, but yet there are a lot of posters all over the place. What do you have to say to that?
Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the amended Electoral Act, um, the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, is a very big achievement for democracy in Nigeria. And we hope that it helps to reduce, if not eliminate, uh, the curse of, of vote rigging in this country, which destroyed confidence in democracy. So that's, it's a big achievement. Now, the Section 84, 12, or whatever you're talking about, which um, required that people who who want to, uh, in public office, who want to contest for positions have to resign. I think it's a correct provision. Um, and I think that it's just very bad and very wrong, you know, when you have people sitting in public offices running subterranean underground political campaigns, because first of all, their mind is no longer on their job. It doesn't matter what they pretend, but you cannot serve God and mammon. I believe that as a public officer, if you're holding a public office and you want to run for office, you should resign and go and focus on what your current preoccupation is. It's your right to run. But I think it's also very, very destructive of Nigeria's national institutions, uh, the way the government is going, trying to fight that section, uh, going to procure crooked court judgments. Uh, and rushing to delete, quote unquote. How can the executive delete a law passed by the National Assembly? Fortunately, the National Assembly has said they're going on appeal and we will see where this will end up. But I don't believe it's right, the government's position, uh, trying to change uh, a duly uh, passed legislation that is on the face of it valid and constitutional. So that's my position. I mean, this is not with regard to any specific person. It's with just as a matter of principle. And it doesn't matter who it is. Um, we should not be doing this. Nigeria's institutions are decaying. They are dying. And this is why our economy is dying. Our institutions should be run by objective and independent professionals. Every institution should not become politicized. But that's sadly what is happening in Nigeria today. Okay. All right. And it many, is no many thanks for, that for, for that submission. So we have another caller on the line. Uh, please go straight to the point, Yakubu. Um, what do you have to say at the to, to the topic at hand? Hello? To the point, Hello? we can hear you loud Hello, and clear. You. Are you hearing me? Yes, please. Yes, my question is that the prof is an academic and uh, he's a, a cerebral professor. Moreover, his, the strategy he has adopted is so far detached from the common run of society. And even those supporting him belong to the same group with him, the professors and what have you. And these professors have never rubbed shoulders to the common man in the street fighting for the, uh, the, 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 their sake. Now, how is he going to, uh, uh, how are they going to get to the common person to make them understand what the professor actually stands for and how he intends to transform their lives? Yes. Question. Professor, did you hear what he said, sir? Can I answer the question? Please go ahead. Yes. First of all, I am not uh, just an academic. I'm a thinker and a doer. I am a transformative leader who has had my hands dirty in all the areas of policy, whether economics, the rule of law, diplomacy and international relations, nation building. I became a professor much later based on all this experience and accomplishments, I was appointed a professor of practice in international business and public policy. So I'm not just a theoretician. I have done it practically. But I want to tell you that there is no practical that can work if it's not based on a sound intellectual theory. If you cannot think it, you cannot do it. If you cannot conceptualize it, you cannot execute it. Let's stop running away from intellect. There's nothing wrong with professors except the professors that have rigged the elections in the past for INEC. Those ones, I don't agree with those professors. But I happen to have practical leadership experience in addition to being an intellectual. So I think you should actually prefer someone like myself. I have managed a national economy as a deputy governor of the central bank. I led the team that developed and introduced the bank verification number, the BVN. I was part of the monetary policy committee that managed inflation down 
from double digit to 8% by 2014 when we left the center. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well done. Well done. Well done. Thank That's you. all that you've been doing thus far. But For before, Nigerians. Before we let you go, you know, because it's been an interesting time on Real Talk, we could get with you to uh, this uh, lunch show. Uh, but before we let you go, there's the last segment of the show, even though we've run out of time, I, but we can touch on one or two uh, topics depending on how we qu quickly give our submission. And the first trending stories, these are stories that bind us as Nigerians. Let me emphasize on that, you know, that interests us as Nigerians. And the first trending story that caught our attention is that of the Nigeria versus Ghana, who tops at the um, shutdown of Abuja Stadium today. I think you mentioned that during your submission earlier. What's your take quickly on this um, um, match? Let me come to you first, uh, Professor Mogalu. Well, I always wish Nigeria a victory. Mm. I always wish a victory in their outings. Uh, I support the Super Eagles, go Super Eagles, um, you know, Nigeria is a great soccer nation. It's one of our great exports to the world. And I'm proud of Nigeria, proud of my country, proud of the Super Eagles. That's Fantastic. what I have to say. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, I think great. for me, uh, let me, let me, let me, before I come to you, Damila, I've watched the first leg of this match and I must say that our boys tried. Well, I start to be corrected. Some people might not agree with me. As far as I'm concerned, I feel that they gave in their best during the first leg of the qualifiers. And I saw most of our players fall in from from left right center I was wondering what is making them fall i think the pitch over there in ghana was not wow. favorable favorable to our boys let me let me put it like that but again it was an away game and i would say that we're out there in a foreign ground and um, there was no way we could have more fans supporting us maybe hence the reason why there are some tensions and they were falling all over the place now <laughs> is the time to make the we're best home. of our own home game and bury all the match uh, or bury all the uh, uh, all, all the matches you know and i feel that we, we have what it takes if you ask me we have all the players yes. and the technical crew as well i can say that uh, it's time for us to win this game and bring um, it home if not if we do not go for that uh, <laughs> what's it called uh, qatar 2023 2023. Uh, it must be an issue so i say i'm predicting a 2-0 win for us today okay. so let uh, let me say that if our boys don't win, we, we, they will not eat Nigerian jollof rice. They'll eat oh, no! <laughs> I agree with you. Damiola, what's your okay. prediction on that? I, I think the only thing, my prediction, ah, prediction will be quite hard, but I wish that we can do a 2-0 at least. To show the Ghana people, one of our Ghana Ghanaian actors also said if Ghana, um, Nigeria won in Ghana that he was going to trek to Nigeria. But unfortunately, <laughs> we had a draw, so he didn't need to trek. But I will borrow... Um, or Dionne Gallo's words and uh, Judy Gallo's words to say that we should just keep the spirits high and cheer our boys. Of course, um, it's never say never. Uh, we might win and we might lose. If we lose, we'll take it in good faith. We'll go back to the um, drawing right. board and make it better. If we win, it's victory for all of us. All right. Many thanks, Zamila, for your submission. I'm hoping, just like pass, uh, I said by, by Professor Mogalu, I've emphasized that if they do not win, there's no Nigerian For one month, no Nigerian All right. The <laughs> second trend story that caught our attention is that of the hypes in politics uh, when it comes to professionals, when it comes to art, uh, artists using their craft to, po to promote uh, uh, politicians. I know that there's a case... Um, out there in our mainstream on social media regarding Timmy Dakolo, uh, who went to play at uh, who sang for Atiku. Uh, who sang for Atiku, and I know that there were a lot of divided uh, opinions in the public space. But quickly, Damila, let me come to you, please, in in few minutes. What what's your take on this? Because we're running. I, out I think um, what happened basically was um, during um, Atiku's uh, declaration, Timmy Dakolo, as a musician, as a musician was invited to um, make one of his rendition. I think, God Bless Nigeria, one Nigeria song that he sang. But Nigerians came at him saying that, oh, you have to be, you are, you are being two-sided. If, um, if you are not supporting the person, why do you go and sing? There? First, he's a <coughs> professional musician. He's working for a livelihood. Mm. Secondly, I do not think, except he's a card-carrying member of that party, then we can now say, oh, you people have divided us and you, are like, you want us to take this route or you're advising this route and you people are doing the next. Because I look at myself as a professional MC. What if I'm beckoned on to come and work? Now, nah, come work, oh, nobody say come, right. I don't get it. Right, so Nigeria should just pipe in low and let people 
who are professionals, do their job professionally, except otherwise, then we can now know how to run. All right, many thanks for that. I think for me, I would like to say that this is a simple issue and it has become controversial or necessarily because of the way politics is being played in our country and the likes of politicians that we have as well. Uh, listening to uh, Professor Mogalu with all his submission does so when it comes to we electing the right leaders in the political space. And the question for me should, would be that if the politicians themselves have integrity and accountability, we, we might not be having the challenges we are having today. However, no, no yeah. matter where each of us belong, when it comes to our expertise, like uh, Damlola uh, mentioned earlier, we can't be called upon. And it is only um, controversial because OAPs and the artists are involved, you know. That's the reason why we are talking about this today. That's the reason why there's a lot of noise about it on our mainstream media. But as professionals, if we have... Uh, uh, we have no right to ask whoever who wants to pay for our service or expertise where they got their money from. That's my opinion. Again, I stand to be corrected. Again, I feel that our business is not to deliver our uh, it's not only to deliver our craft and get paid because on or because of agreements. When I say agreement, I mean MOU, SLA, and all of that. Whether it is politicians it, it, uh, or, or not, I just feel that when it comes to um, the matter of our craft, you know, yes, we might be paid and we are dependent on the role we are going to play, but we should also lend our voice. Again, uh, looking at this from another angle, I felt that. The, they pay the shoe and the clothes makers that they uh, that that uh, the, the, that merchandise that, them that exactly you... and the makers of the shoes or the clothes don't even know them. Some of them just feel that okay, we bought the shoes from uh, on site or, or something. Or the printers and they realize that yes, they are wearing their products. So I don't think that that should be different from an artist that is out there. And I just feel that we should educate ourselves when it comes to performing at an event, especially when it comes to endorsements. However. It is our civic responsibility, I must emphasize, is when it comes to artists, you know, to influence um, uh, people when it comes to their followership, to, uh, to, to, to engage yeah. them. Because I feel that we need to encourage our leaders when it comes to a place of truth, when it comes to a place of accountability, just like I emphasize on. And of course, when it comes to a, a place of uh, transparency, because what affects one affects affect all. all. And that is exactly where we yeah. are today. If we are conscious of that, I think some of the challenges that we are facing in Nigeria... Are we going to be dropped let me hear your opinion, sir. What's your take on this um, trending story? No, I think you're, you've got it very correct. The reason why there's a lot of controversy over artists performing at political events is because of the character of our politics and the failure of our political leaders and the corruption that has come to be associated with them. So that's, that's number one. Number two, I believe that artists should be able who are influential should be able to endorse political leaders of their choice, provided that that is not procured. It's not bought. A lot of influencers are bought by money, not because of what they believe. Selling your influence is not being an influencer. You are part of the problem. But if an artist is influential and based on his or her own conviction as a civic duty, as a citizen, feels that Kingsley Moriallo is the right president for Nigeria, and says to her, his or her two, three, four million followers, that's the man to vote for. Uh, God knows, I, I, did, I wouldn't have paid for it. It is out of his or her conviction. That's quite all right. And in fact, if you look at advanced countries, even in America, many artists do that, you know, and that's how they use their, their influence to shape public policy by influencing the kind of leaders that emerge. Our, our artists need to move to this level is what has been happening since 1999. Are the traditional politicians doing well for you and for me? If the answer is no, why do you have to be supporting them? Why can't you support a shift to a new kind of leadership and a new breed and a new generation of leadership? That would be a very good use of your artistic platform, in my view. All right, many thanks for that great submission. And I must say that we've come to the end of another edition of Real Talk with Kiki. I wish that this uh, uh, edition was the end in our top. But <laughs> not that we're going to be inviting you back uh, on this platform. And indeed, it was an awesome show on today's yeah, edition sure. of Real Talk with Kiki. Courtesy, our resourceful guest, Professor Kingsley Bogan. I wish you the very best in your, um, uh, what's it called, presidential so ambition. Uh, ambition and um, all the best. Enjoy the rest of your day. To my co-host, I say thank, thank you. you for keeping <laughs> it real. And bye now. Thank you. Okay, bye.